It's the brother Kosh Pakala. <clears throat> Salakia. Brother Kosh Pakala coming back at you with another lesson, giving all glory, honor, and praises to Yahweh Bahashim, Yahweh Shai, Bahashim, Rechakwadash. Double honors to the apostles and elders of Great Millstone who rule and teach well. Peace, love, salutation to the elect 144 first fruit. And, you know, you see, uh, I have on my screen uh, 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 the leader of the GOCC. Elder um, Rakar, Raka. and um, pretty much this has been floating around, you know, Israel, or, you know, really GMS. I've seen a few videos already. Um, Apostle Gabar has done a lesson, two lessons so far, matter of fact, on this. Um, Apostle Ramla, Apostle Taharez. I was just uh, in the midst of um, Elder Yashawamba down in Dallas in his video. His video is titled GOCC with a colon Deuteronomy 23 and 7 will not save Edom. I recommend y'all go watch that video. I may put some of the videos in the description box below if y'all haven't caught it. You know, but we're contenders of the, you know, we contend the faith. We see something going left and we steer it back right. That's our job. That's our occupation. One thing I wanted to do was actually, you know, as you can see his face right there. You know, I, I, I'm i going to keep it a buck. I didn't just pause it right here and just wait for him to make the most, you know, obscure face. But, you know, matter of fact, just I'm just going to play it a little bit, you know, just so we can relax that thing, even though... <laughs> But, you know, watching this video, one thing that stuck out to me was conduct. The scriptures talk about holy conversation and how you should be conducting yourself. Now, there's, there was um, an individual who called in to, I guess, his hotline to ask a sincere question uh, to this man. And it was particularly about, can Esau be saved? Just simply put, now he was asking a question. He said, hey, I heard it from GOCC that, you know, the so-called white man or the Edomites can have a chance to be saved. And the way he responded to this individual was extremely, it was just mean, you know. Now, you know, us men at GMS, we do understand you know, that feelings don't play a big aspect in things, especially in prophecy, because prophecy doesn't, it doesn't matter how you feel. It's just what's going to happen is what's going to happen. Facts don't care about how you feel. It is what it is. You have to deal with it. The scriptures also talk about there is no respect of persons. It is what it is. You have to deal with it. That's simple. So I'm not just over here harping at the fact that the man was just mean to him, but it just what it was. Okay. The man was, and I don't, you know, it just what it is. He was at, he was absolutely mean to this individual who called in to ask a sincere question. Now the scriptures tell us to be gentle, which I have a few scriptures up here right now. It says, be gentle to all men, which matter of fact, I'm just going to start with first Thessalonians two and seven. It says, um, but we are gentle among you. Okay. It says, but we are gentle among you, even as a nurse cherish, cherisheth her children. Okay. The apostle, I, I, I've met, you know, two apostles, you know, the Lord, you know, it was a pleasure meeting them as well. Apostle Ramlab and Apostle uh, Rakar. And not in both of them. And I can sure if I if I were ever to meet the other apostles and elders, you know, I met Elder Manatazak, you know, Elder Ibad, Elder Ibdon. None of them were just extremely rude or just mean, you know, for no reason. They, Apostle Ramla cooked for me <laughs> and served my plate. 
something real talk that, you know, I was like, man, it's a huge sign of humility from a man who's been doing it for so long. Apostle Ramlab did, you know what I'm saying? These men have been gentle with the fruit that they, you know, pretty much that the spirit had them produce. Their fruit, I'm their fruit. You know, they have been gentle with us. Of course, you know, you have stern admonishment, reproofs and rebukes, of course. You know, that's just our culture as Israelites. But it's out of love. But it's just, they don't just, if one of us have a question, excuse my Swahili, just shit on us. Like this man did that individual who called in. It's character. It's how you conduct yourself. Even if you may not have, first off, if you don't have the correct answer, because the way he broke down Deuteronomy 23 and 7 was extremely incorrect. But even if you don't have the right answer, first things first is you're supposed to have enough humility to be like, hey, I just don't know. Let me go inquire or let me do some due diligence and study about it to get and I'll get back to you and give you that answer. Or let's go through it together. When this man called in and asked the question, this he bullied him in <laughs> to saying to to agreeance with what he thinks is correct. He was mean to the individual. He always interrupted the individual. He was not gentle with the individual who called in asking a sincere question in a question that needs to be talked about and has already been talked about and already been broken down and it's been out there. I remember um, Apostle Ramlob did a, a lesson a few years back on Deuteronomy 23 and 7. This is 2 Timothy chapter 2 and 23. It says, but foolish and unlearned questions avoid. And in a sense of how he was teaching, quote unquote, if you could see me, I would be putting up air quotations, how he was teaching this individual. OK, he was in a sense of like he was asking an unlearned question. No, it was a legitimate question, according to, uh, you know, about the scripts to get understanding about it. And you bully him and you interrupt him. You don't allow him to ask questions. You don't allow him to understand what you are trying to explain. When you teach, you are to explain and persuade. The scriptures say, let every man be persuaded. Okay? That simple. Your teaching should persuade someone to get it or to want to believe it. Look at Paul when he... Through his whole trial, when you read the book of Acts, he went up to Agrippa and told him, and Agrippa damn near believed him and was almost persuaded, but he didn't force or bully nobody to believe it. If you get it, you get it. That simple. This man on the other end, oh, so we, we agree that Edom is like, nah, man. That's not how that's not how it works. You are to break it down and explain the script. So it says, knowing that they do gender strifes. Now, this man, hey, I will say the other guy on the line, he didn't, he did not, you know, try to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with him. He had a level of respect. Okay? He had a level of respect. Which was good. It, that showed good character by that individual who called in. All right. He said, I'm not trying to come up here with, you know, I'm not trying to, you know, get into some bickering contest or whatever. You know what I'm saying? He said that. He's, I'm just sincerely asking a question. And it was immediately an issue for this individual right here. Probably because he, he, he know he ain't breaking it down right. Verse 24 says, in the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach patience. He showed no sign of patience. He had no sign of being uh, of gentleness towards an individual who sincerely did not know. That's why he's coming to you to ask a question because he sees you as an elder who did not know and needed understanding on a particular topic 
But you bully him. You bully him into agreeing with what you're saying instead of explaining what you claim to think is right or what you claim to believe and persuading him through understanding. Okay? Deuteronomy 23 and 7 is immediately what he brought out. Thou shalt not abhor an Edomite, for he is thy brother. Thou shalt not abhor an Egyptian, because thou was a stranger in his land. So pretty much, G now, I'm going to say it, G-O-C-C -C, preaches that Esau can be saved. And I'm going to agree with the uh, Apostle Gabar. Teach that probably because he took the bag. Okay? Took the bag. So you have to you have to preach a certain doctrine. It's the same thing with having a 501c3 charter. There's certain things you can't say to people or your congregation, or you will not be tax exempt anymore. First off, why are you being taxed for an organization? Uh, you know, why do you have to go get a tax exemption in the first place? Just go on the highways and byways and teach. You don't need no LLC or whatever for that. You don't need it. Okay? Simply put. Now, if you're saying Esau can be saved, then you clearly don't understand fully what the new covenant entails. All right? Because when you read about the new covenant, which I have here in Ezekiel 37, I'm just going to go through the Ezekiel 37 <laughs> one. You can read it in Jeremiah 31. You can read it in Hebrews, the eighth chapter. It's mentioned, the Lord mentions it three times to get it installed in a thick skull of an Israelite. Because the scriptures talk about in the book of Ezekiel that is a stiff neck, hard headed nation, stubborn. Isaiah, the first chapter, talks about what? An ox know it. Uh, Noah's uh, his, his master, just loosely paraphrasing, was that Isaiah 1, 1 and 3? In an ass, his donkey's, uh, in an ass, his uh, master's crib, two stubborn ass animals, but Israel doth not consider. This is a prime example of a non consideration. Have you not considered Ezekiel 37, uh, uh, Hebrews the 8th chapter, Jeremiah the 31st verse? Uh, uh, the 31st chapter, have you not considered those? So Ezekiel 37 and 15 says, The word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Moreover, thou son of man, take thee one stick, write upon it for Judah and for the children of East, uh, Salakia of Israel, his, his companions. Now, I don't see Esau in this, all right, so far. Let's keep going. Then take another stick. And write upon it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, all right, and for all the house of Israel, his companions, and join them one to another until one stick, and they shall become one in thine hand. And that's why what? We go out there with a whole 12 tribe sign, all right? It's a hook. It's the bait. It reels people in, all right? And the people that we're looking for is the elect 144. That's that's another that's another just mentioning the elect 144. That's another way it cuts um, Esau being saved because have you? <laughs> how wish I said it all the time? Have you not read? Have you not read Revelation the seventh chapter? Doesn't mention and twelve thousand out of the tribe of Edom. Or whatever, out of the tribe of the Amalekites. It does not mention that. It only speaks about Israel. And when it comes to salvation, it speaks about Israel. <laughs> not no other nation. All right, continuing, it says verse 18. And I'm going to read swiftly because I want to get to the point of this. Verse 18, and when the children of thy people shall speak unto thee, saying, Will thou uh, not show us? What thou meanest by these, say unto them, thus saith the Lord power, behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of, uh, of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel, his fellows, and will put them with uh, and will put them with him, even with the stick of Judah, 
and make them one stick, and they shall be one in my hand. That goes back to the script where it, it mentions uh, Ephraim shall not vex Judah. Okay? The tribes are going to come back together. All right? And you can see it, the prophecy, that prophecy happening through the camps throughout the, the whole United States and throughout the four corners of the earth. Not every camp is just one comprised of one tribe. Through faith, some men think they're Gadites. Through faith, some men think they're Reuben, Judah, Ephraim, so on and so forth. And we come and we have came together. Okay? That's just one example of showing how the tribes are coming back together as one. It says verse 20, it says, In the sticks whereon uh, thou uh, writest shall be in thine hand before their eyes. Verse 21, and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord power, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen. <clears throat> Cut right there. I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen. So there is a clear, distinct separation that the Lord is making. Okay? And I'm going to read that again. I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen. And that's another, and this is another example, that part right there in the um, in verse 21, Ezekiel 37 to 21, you could use to explain the Gentiles. <laughs> There's we might get we're gonna get into that today too, because you gotta understand uh, uh, Gentiles and, and things that the word stranger and all these things to get a full grasp and understanding on how the other heathen nations will not be saved with the children of Israel. The only other thing the other heathen nations are going to partake in is slavery. Simple. They're going to be under subjection. It's Isaiah, the second chapter. Okay? And that's Micah, uh, uh, Micah the fourth chapter, which literally are word for word one to another when you read them. The Lord shall establish the, his mountain above all the other mountains, meaning taking down governments and establishing his own government, his way. Meaning if you're taking, when you go into the book of Revelation and read, and it talks about uh, Shai having many, crown, uh, many crowns, that means he took down many nations. And what do you think? He's just going to be holding hands with them, skipping through, uh, uh, um, what? <laughs> Fucking... Flower land? I don't know. I don't know what goes on in your mind or what you think or perceive is going to happen, but that's not according to the scripts. If, if, if you're taking down a nation, guess what they're going to be unto you? A tributary. Or in, in other words, a more simplistic term, slave. Paying tribute is paying taxes. If you're paying taxes right now, you are considered a slave. Why do you think the Edom... The, <laughs> The Edomites, who are the self-proclaimed white man, is going to be saved, and we pay taxes to him, which would be what? Equivalent to us being his slave. Why would he get rewarded salvation for that? That does not make sense. You got to explain these things. So you're telling Israel went through slavery and all this just for the person who oppressed us and depressed us for the longest time can can get saved? That does not make sense. That's not that's not a righteous recompense. Second Thessalonians, what, the first chapter? Them that trouble you, have you not read? Going on, it says. In verse 21, whether they be gone, right, because this is also, uh, you got to understand how many captivities we've been through. This is a prophecy also to all the way going to the Greeks and Hellen uh, Hellenization, which we're going to get to. It says, and we'll gather them one er on, on every side and bring them into their own land. Right, because Israel is going to be scattered. Okay. Verse 22, it says, and I will make them one nation in the land, in the land upon the nation, uh, upon the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king to, uh, to them all. 
And they shall be no more two nations, neither shall they be divided into kingdoms anymore at all. Because that goes back to, you know, after Solomon ended his rule, Rehoboam and Jeroboam, the, the nations, you know, Israel split. Northern and southern tribes. Okay. Verse 23, neither shall they defile themselves anymore with their idols, nor with their de detestable things, nor with any of uh, with any of their transgressions. But I will save them out of all their dwelling places where they have sinned and will cleanse them. So shall they be my people and I will be their power. Now, I don't see Esau mentioned in that. All right. Hebrews 12. <clears throat> and 15 uh, and 14, follow peace with all men and holiness without uh, without which no man shall see the Lord. Verse 15, looking diligently, lest any man fell of the grace of the Most High, lest any man, any root of bitterness spring up, trouble you and there and thereby many be defiled, lest there be any fornicator or profane. I'm emphasizing that profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright, okay? The reason why I emphasize profane, profane means outside the temple. So you, let me break it down to you in a simplistic form because of understanding what 1 Corinthians, um, I want to say the third chapter in the beginning says, I have spoken unto you carnal things, so you pretty much so you can understand the spiritual things. So you go to the club, Okay. You go to the club. There are VIP sections. People who, um, people who, I guess, pre-ordered whatever a table gets that section. All right. So when they show up to the club at whatever time, they sit in that section that they paid for. Now, when they get there, why would you think they would allow? Any random person to enter into that vicinity. It is in the same situation as salvation, according to the scripts. Salvation is for the Israelites in a particular set of Israelites, aka the elect 144,000 and the and the elect one third. We've got VIP access to a chariot. Why would you think the Lord would allow an Elamite? Because if you're saying Edomite could be saved, let's just go ahead and say it. You think every every nation can. So why would the Lord allow an Elamite, an Edomite? Okay. A um and on top of that, the 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 selection. Like I said, you know, you, someone will call the club, whatever, order a table before they get there. And when they get there, they'll sit at their particular place. That is a, another example, carnally speak, you know, carnal, as a carnal example of what you call predestination. It was already predestined that Edom would not get mercy. And it was already predestined that 144,000 Israelites would get salvation. Don't change the narrative. Don't think you can. The scriptures don't say Esau can be saved. And from this, it says they are profane persons. So those elect members that were that the Lord, you know, called in, <laughs> made it, you know, made a reservation or whatnot. OK, those are the ones who are going to enter into that VIP table, which is a chariot and away from the destruction. It's that simple. Everybody else is outside or profane. The word profane means outside the temple. And that's Esau. So again, Hebrews 12 and 16, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. So he is outside of the temple. He's not included in anything other than demise, destruction, uh, any adjective. Starting with the letter D, <laughs> demolished, destroyed, decimated. I don't care. That's 
Those are the adjectives that are going to be assigned to Esau coming up here soon. Not salvation, not saved, not preserved. Esau is perishable. Okay? He is not going to be saved. East Edom will not be saved. It's just that simple. Okay? It's that simple. All right? This is uh, 1 Peter 1 and 1. It says, Peter, an apostle of Yahweh Shai Hamashiach, to the, uh, to the, so like here, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. The reason why I bring this up, because we mentioned in Ezekiel, the 37th chapter, speaking about the new covenant that Esau is not a part of, because you don't see it here, okay? It says what? In verse 21, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen. Now, when you read this, it says to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, all right? To the strangers scattered throughout Pontus. So what is that word stranger? All right. Strong's G, <clears throat> 3927. Para Parepidemas. Para All right. Which in the in the in the Greek it means one who becomes of one who comes from a foreign country into a city or land to reside there by the side of the natives, all right, <laughs> one who comes from a foreign country. Now, okay, let's understand that. So Israelites coming from what the Greeks would see as a foreign country, they came. Another prime example, let me hold that, that, that point I'm about to make, a prime example. We've all read the book. Babylon, the Timbuktu, and in that book it said a million of those Israelites migrated to Africa. So that means Israelites who used to live in a particular country, which were their native country, moved to another country foreign to them, all right, and dwelled there with those natives. So one who comes from a foreign country into a city or land to reside, reside there by the side of the natives, simply put, to put to, to, to keep to bring it home, we wake up and we understand we're Israel, okay, we're Israelites, but we live here in America. This is not our land, so we are strangers to this land. Our original land is over to the east. Over in Israel. That's our land. That is our native land. The scriptures talk about it. Jerusalem, the mother of us, uh, the mother of us all. Okay? Not Africa. I think that's what in the book of Galatians, if brothers want to put the, the script below. Okay? So we are strangers. So in this case, when Peter is speaking, he is speaking to the Israelites who migrated to these other cities, countries, a.k.a. Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, which is what you would call at, um, back then Asia Minor. OK. The strangers scattered there. All right. Because they were mingled with amongst the heathen. OK. Going back one more time, let's get that word stranger here, because you have to understand these things. All right. It says a sojourner in a, in a strange place, a foreigner. America is a strange place. All right, Strong's definition, it says a pilgrim. Here's the word pilgrim. The word pilgrim is a person traveling to a holy place. In the spirit, that's what we're doing right now, traveling to a holy place. And the word holy goes back uh, to the word what? Consecrated and goes back to the word separate. A separate place. 
And the separate place is the place that Ezekiel was talking about here. It says what? Whither they be gone, and I will gather them on every so like it, I will gather them on every side to and bring them into their own land. Own is a possessive word. Their own. So it's a separate thing. This is or the if you're speaking in the sense of yourself, this is my car. This is my house. This is my own money. Okay? Something that is possessive, which separates it from everybody else. <laughs> that simple. It says a traveler. Okay? A pilgrim, a crusader, foreigner. All right. So Peter is speaking to Israelites who are not in their particular own land. Let's go to let's go to Galatian. Galatian 2, let's start at 6. It says, but of these who seem to be uh, somewhat whatsoever, this is Paul speaking, okay? Uh, whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me. The most high accepted no man's person. And I was going back to what I was saying in the inception of this video. There's no respect to person, so feelings are out the equation. We deal with facts here in GMS. It says, For they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me, but contrary wise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision, one, I'm saying one for a reason, was committed unto me as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter, who uh, it says, for he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostles of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles too. Okay. And when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me Barnabas, the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen three and they unto the circumcision. The reason I say one, two and three is because Paul called Israelites who were not in the know that they were Israel, uncircumcised, a Gentile, and heathen. Which all of those are synonyms unto the uh, unto one another. Okay? So let's just deal with the word Gentiles here in this specific scripture. In this specific scripture. Then we're going to go get Romans, the book of Romans. And we're going to get the word Gentile in that a specific uh, scripture. All right. So ethnos is the word for Gentile in this specific scripture. Okay. When he uses the word Gentile, it says a, a multitude, uh, whether of men or of beasts, associated or living together, a company, troops, swarm, says a multiple individuals of the same nature or genus, the human family, a tribe, nation, people group. Okay. So it's a tribe, nation, and people group, okay? Let's go back up. It says, same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles, which is a tribe, people, or nation group. So what tribe, what people, or what nation group was Paul speaking about when he was using the word Gentile? The Israelites. Simple. You go back to what I think I want to say is Philippians where he said, I am a Benjamite. <laughs> I mean, you no, know, he said, I'm an Israelite from the tribe of Benjamin. Okay? Even when Yahweh Shai was on the scene, you read John the first chapter. He said, ah, an Israelite indeed. You think he was dealing with an Edomite indeed? No, he was not. He was dealing with Israel. Okay? It's the same thing in the sense of what Paul is dealing with as well. So when he said Gentile here, he's speaking of a specific tribe, nation of people, which were the Israelites, not the Edomites. Not the Edomites. Edom will not be saved. So if you're telling me Edom will be saved, these men, these Israelite men, Paul, Peter, John, Titus, Jude, um, no, it's another, James, these men were speaking that Esau can be saved when they were sick and tired of him, uh, of Esau, <laughs> sick and tired of Esau, having them in, in, in subjection. Make this make sense to me. 
This is Romans chapter 2 and 9. It says, Tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. Now, we understand the Jew, which would be as a short for the word Judah, but we're still going to get it here in the Greek. Strong's G, 2453, Eudias. Eudias. Eudias, which is Jewish, belonging to the Jewish nation, which we know the word Jew came from the word Judah, or the tribe of Judah says belonging to Judah, okay, which are Israelites, the ones in a sense, who are in the know, in the circumcision, who know they're Israelites. And it says, and also of the Gentile. Now, we notice when we get this word Gentile here, it's Helen. Hellenic, pertaining to Greece. Okay? So the reason why the word Gentile, in a sense, is used as the word Helen in the, in the Greek here is because, let's, let's break it down a little bit. It says of the Jew first, so he's speaking to the Israelites and also of the Gentile. Now to the Israelites who are not in the know. That's why I said one, two, and three in Galatians, uncircumcised, Gentile, and heathen. There's three different things that Paul called the ones who were Israelites but not in the know. Who didn't know they're Israelites. That's why it was so wrought effectually within Paul to go and preach to them to tell them. That they're Israel. It's the same zeal and fire that we have today. We go onto the highways and buy, hey, you are Israel. You are not a nigga. You are not a Mexican. You are not a spick. You are not a wetback. You are not an Indian. Okay? You're Gad. You're Reuben. You're Issachar. You're, you're, you know, you're Simeon. Because today, what you, what you would call Hellenic or Hellenization is Americanization or being American brainwashed. It's the same thing Alexander the Great did when he came on the scene when you read the book of Maccabees. That's why you read the first chapter that talks about wicked men of Israel you know, went to receive license to do wickedly or do according to the heathen. And what happens to a generation... That ruins a generation down the line because they start raising them in the customs of a Greek. A Helen, a Hellenized Jew is a Greek speaking Jew, someone who keeps the custom uh, of the Greeks. That's what it is. OK. Who keeps the custom of the Greeks. That's why Paul called them heathens, because they're keeping customs of the heathen. Apostle Gabar said it early in his video. He says, if it quacks like a duck, it walks like a duck, it looks like a duck. Well, God dang it, it's a duck. So if you have a <laughs> prime example in this, in this time, it walks like an American, it talks like an American, it looks like it, well, God dang it, it's an American. Or if it, if it talked like a nigga, looked like a nigga, well, God dang it, it's a nigga. If the shoe fit, wear it. <laughs> you feel me? The word Helen is a Greek either by nationality, or whether a native of the mainland or of a Greek island or colonies. In a wider sense, the name embraces all nations, not Jews, that made language, customs, and learning of the Greeks their own. So it was just Israelites who made the custom of a Greek their own. Okay? You have to understand uh, what a gen the Gentile strangers, all of that is, to get a better grasp and understanding that, yes, this all ties into Esau not being saved. We just, Israel just fucked up and fucked around and started doing the customs of an Edom. That's all it was. Doesn't mean Esau, it, it, that's another prime example of why Esau shouldn't be saved. He forced Israel to go off and then turn around to the Lord, expecting the Lord to do something to us. See, look, 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 they're going off. They're going off. But you want that type of individual to be saved? Get out of town. Get out of town. Jake be bugged out. Now let's get into what the, what the Lord thinks of Esau. 
This is Jeremiah chapter 25 and 15. It says, For thus saith the Lord, power of Israel unto me, take the wine cup of, of this fury at my hand and cause all the nations to whom I send thee to drink it. It says what? Take the wine cup of this fury at my hand and cause all the nations to whom I send thee to, who, to whom I send thee to drink it. Now, there's 18 nations, okay? All right. Uh, let me get a precept, though, to that, that wine cup. <clears throat> All right. Let's see. Um, this is Revelation 14 and 9. And the third angel followed them, saying uh, with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive uh, the karagma, Okay, in his forehead or in his or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of the most high, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. Okay. Jeremiah 20, uh, 25 and 15. The, uh, for thus saith the Lord power of Israel unto me, take the wine cup of this fury at my hand and cause all the nations to whom I send thee to drink it. Verse 16. And they shall drink and be moved and be mad because of the sword that I will send among them. Now, we're going to get the list. We're going to get the list of nations who are who are on this. You know, we're going to get the nations who are on this list to drink this cup and be moved to be angry because they're going to get their ass dealt with. <laughs> All right. Let's see if Esau is on that list. Let's see if Edom is on that list. <laughs> Verse 17. Then took I the, the cup at the Lord's hand. And made all the nations to drink unto whom the Lord hath sent me to wit Jerusalem, the cities of Judah and the kings thereof, the princes thereof, to make them a desolation and an astonishment and hissing and a curse as it is this day. Right. Because we had certain individuals who said, race it, race it. I'm not going to mention that, but you should know who it is if you read the scripts. Anyone in GOCC. All right. Verse 19. Pharaoh, king of Egypt. All right. Okay. Cool. Cool. Okay. Maybe starting to list some uh, some some nations and his servants and his princes and all his people and all the mingled people and all the kings of the land of Uz and all the kings of the land of the Philistine uh, Philistines and Ashkelon and Aaz and Ekron the remnant of Ashdod so them Hamites. Okay. Verse twenty one. Who do we have first up on the line in that verse? Edom. And Moab and the children of Ammon. I'm just going to stop it right there. Does that sound like salvation? That sounds like a prophecy of doom. To that particular nation. Do you not have a. Um, what is it? A, a Bible dictionary. And look up Edom. The only nation in the Bible. That's not receiving any type of mercy. The other nations are receiving mercy. By going into slavery. Esau of Edom is going to be totally done away with according to the according to the prophecies and according to the scriptures. So where are you getting this absurd breakdown of Esau being saved? It doesn't make sense. Make this make sense to me. And now you got you're, you're sitting up here teaching a sincere individual asking you a question whether Esau can be saved or not. And you're totally telling him the wrong thing. Going to Deuteronomy 23 and 7, it's an easy breakdown. Go to Genesis, the 28th chapter. Okay? Genesis, the 28th chapter. Now, like the fifth or sixth verse. Yeah, fifth. The, uh, let's see. Yeah, the fifth verse. And Isaac sent away Jacob and went into Pandaran unto Laban, or Laban, a son of Bethuel, and the Syrian, the brother of Rebekah, Jacob's. And Esau's mother, the Syrian. Okay, uh, uh, let's get Hosea, Hosea 12. Hosea 12 and 12. And, and Jacob fled into the country of Syria. And Israel served for a wife and for a wife. He kept he kept sheep. He didn't flee into the land of Edom. What makes you think Esau can be saved? The Most High hates Esau. It's basic milk scriptures. 
Basic milk scriptures such as this one I'm reading. Malachi 1 and 2. I have loved you, saith the Lord, yet ye say, wherein then has I loved us? Was Esau, uh, Salakia, was not Esau Jacob's brother, saith the Lord, yet I loved Jacob? Verse 3, the point, and I hated Esau? That's what the Lord said. If you hate somebody, you, you want to be around them? Hell no. Do you want them around? Hell no. So why would you want to do a favor for him? And I hated Esau and laid his mountain and his heritage waste for the dragons of the wilderness. Like this is basic scripts that cut your whole ideology, ideology of what you think is to be correct. You're breaking the scriptures down incorrectly. Explain to me Jeremiah 25 and the fate of Esau. Explain to me the whole book of Obadiah and the fate of Esau. You got to explain these things. What you call is, this is, you're showing how much of a reprobate, okay, or reprobate you are. Because if Esau can be saved, you got to go that you got to go back to the book of Obadiah and break that back down and, and, and tell, tell me, make, make that make sense to me with your doctrine. You're leading Israel astray and that's blood on your hands. All right. Man, I hope that individual who called in watched these lessons, you know, I hope he watched these lessons and understands. OK. Thou shalt not abhor an Assyrian. OK. Simply put, the apostles have already done a broke a breakdown on this. OK. Simply put, matter of fact, let me get uh, I think in. Deuteronomy 26, it kind of speaks on it too. Yeah, let me do around 26 and 5. And thou shalt speak and say before the Lord that power, a Syrian ready to perish, was my father. And he went down into Egypt and sojourned uh, there uh, with the few and became a great nation, great, mighty, and populous. A Syrian. Thou shalt not abhor a Syrian. Okay? All right, so Lord willing, this was edifying. Um, I'm going to give all glory, honor, and praises to Yahweh by Hashem Yahweh Shai, by Hashem Rechakwadash. Double honors to the apostles and elders of Great Millstone to rule and teach well. Peace and salutation to the elect 144 first fruit. Okay? Uh, this is Brother Kashkwa. Until the next time, we'll say Shalom. And like always, repent for Yahweh Shai is on his way back and is coming sooner than what we believe. And yes, his name is Yahweh Shai, not Christ. Yahweh Shai. All right, in the heavenly omnipotent power's name is Yahweh, which means he is or he exists. All right, Yahweh Shai's name means he delivers. There's no other religion or book or whatever who has a, a savior named he delivers. Only the Israelites have it. We're the only nation that have that power. And he's going to show it here soon. So shalom.